Regardless of whether you're a SpongeBob fan still to this day or you dropped off at some point, I believe of these three movies, this is just the worst one. Let's go through it. Also plugging my Insta. <laughs> first movie review in a while gotta thank the armada for being patient thank you guys so much you guys are amazing i also plan to start opening up some reddit threads for news topics of things that i might not get to in time also just video stuff so come over to the reddit throw in some memes feel free to roast me talk about whatever fun stuff is happening within animation or its community however this movie here never have i been so unexcited for a spongebob release like even with camp coral there was this morbid curiosity to see how the final product was and seeing how long it will go. Even with season 12, while different from the Spongebob I grew up with, it still has fans who love the new style and a staff that's passionate about this. But this? This? Sponge on a Run is 90 minutes of confirming your deepest fears and concerns with the little sponge. That range between too far into the selling out and monetizing range, to just enough where the little guy is stretched into a lot of places, but they make sense. However, this? This doesn't make sense. Like, I'm not gonna pull any punches here. Not even on these studio logos. Let's start there. So we got a discount background character from Wonder Park introducing the Paramount Animations logo, which is funny because it's taken us a while to get some news about Wonder Park. Apparently they're supposed to have a show, but we've heard nothing about it. Also, the movie is not really that good anyway, so I think they should kind of nix that while they can. SpongeBob does this thing with the Nickelodeon movies logo, and then the MRC logo comes on like a bootleg THS logo, no frills, just a swipe. We get a tropical shot of what's supposed to be Bikini Atoll, and already there is so much wrong. Yes, there has been a tradition within the three movies to show a shot of Bikini Atoll, with their various interpretations of showing the visuals, and let's look at the first two so that you can understand what I'm trying to get at here. They look like they have life! First movie, look at how the island sticks out a little off center towards the left, giving that iconic look. And yes, I am going to say left because we're looking at it from the left, by the way. And look at that aesthetic. It's just mwah, beautiful. The second movie also does it too. A little more to the left and the sky isn't exactly full of life, but you know what? I can rock with it. But this, this, oh, it has life. All right. It looks like you filmed the secret hideout of what happened to that Squidward suicide scene. And yes, I'm not going to forget about that. But speaking of offense, the temperate, pristine, shallow seas of the tropics. A place of unparalleled beauty and fecundity. These islands play host to a vibrant ecosystem below. A vast- Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Whoa, 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 stop. Okay. All the respect in the world to Tim Hill. He's been around since season one. He's worked on the first movie, also seasons four and five, but we have a narrator. And you can't even go, oh, well, the voice actor wasn't available to do the role because they were busy with other projects. The guy who literally voice acts the main character is in this movie. Like, you have to be deliberately going out of your way to do things or just have no idea about your own show to get that messed up so much. Now, when it comes to his actual words, they do what you think. They set up the tone for this nautical adventure. You know, with the sea life that he ever so relaxingly goes through character by character. Oh, but not before showing you this underwater shot of the various undersea flora and fauna, trying to show you that this is underwater, guys. Remember that. This is a nautical adventure with our sea sponge and his pals. And you know what? I'll give it this. When I saw the animation previously, I wasn't convinced that it would look the best in movie form, especially in a long form sort of way, but it's actually really well put together. The lighting is great, the characters still feel like they are who they are rather than an imitation. And not only that, but I enjoy the beginning jokes. It has a really good atmosphere, a feel good atmosphere. Good morning, Patrick. What you two knuckleheads keep it down out there? Good, good morning, morning Squidward! Squidward! <laughs> Honestly, I would show you the more wholesome joke of Spongebob feeding and playing with Gary only for Gary to eat the toy with Spongebob saying that it will come out later. However, that has music overlaid that part. That music companies are tighter than the amount of space between the window and Squidward's nose. <laughs> Now while the movie tries to convince you that Spongebob has more hobbies and activities when spending time with Gary, which is also incredibly questionable nowadays, let's go over. What do I want from this movie? Do I want this movie to be like the first movie? Absolutely not. This is a new staff, a new team, a new Spongebob. Do I need it to even reference any of the first seasons? 
No, I think you can do just fine with how Spongebob and Patrick act nowadays. Do I want this movie to solve some lore problem or do something that absolutely has to do with the second movie or continue in like this chain of episodes sort of deal? No, you can make a standalone movie and work just fine. What I want from a Spongebob movie is a Spongebob crew having a Spongebob adventure and having Spongebob levels of fun. Be nautical, be authentic to the characters that we see on TV, be funny, just be Spongebob. Like we've only had about 20 some years years of seeing exactly what that means under different crew's iterations. So with that said, there are some good moments within this movie, in fact, Act A might be my favorite part, and you'll see why very soon with the other two acts. We have Spongebob saying goodbye to Gary, Squidward dropping his iconic phrase, another day, another, day, another, another migraine day. comment, under some cleverly placed woodwind-centric music, and even a Kelpie G mention. In fact, they would go on to do some other references. <sighs> But you should know that old Gertrude's getting pretty finicky these days. Old Gertrude? Who the kelp is that? You've worked with her for years! She's the eight burner grill in the kitchen! Deadpan Spongebob, underrated. His expression here really makes this part of the interaction. However, in cinematic fashion, we have all of the theatrics involved in opening the Krusty Krab raised to 11, as it should be for a movie. And honestly, just as a fan of the show, I really wish we got more of these parts because we understand what they mean. We understand what the Krusty Krab means to the crew. We understand all of the tiny aspects and features of the Krusty Krab. We know how much the Krusty Krab means to Bikini Bottomites. All of this looks great and it sets up the importance of how these characters operate in the day-to-day -day lives. Plankton is even great here, with the comically oversized telescope that you would have to pay a coin to use. I don't know what's up with him and being inconvenienced by coins, but ever since Imitation Crabs, he seems to place these coin slots only to his detriment. Karen being oh so optimistic about Plankton's new endeavor would only show another reason why I liked Act A, continuing the theme of building these characters up. Even though the wall of failure acts as a collection of why Karen shouldn't root for Plankton, I'd say it is these pictures, some of which I know the exact episode and reference that builds up Plankton as the usual antagonist who never learns from his arrogance and greed. Despite being 99% hot gas, they build him up to be a solid character that I can't wait to go up against Spongebob or Mr. Krabs' plans. Speaking of, without dropping a beat, we'd get to see another main character. <laughs> I'm gonna see if Mr. Krabs wants to be an early adopter of my new technology. Wait, what? You're gonna replace me with a robot? Don't do it! <laughs> no, silly, that's gonna happen anyway. This is something much more innovative and startup-y. Plus one for the eventual AI taking over the brain's joke, and plus ten for the Sandy and Mr. Krabs dynamic. One that isn't seen as much, but appreciated nonetheless, especially for being something that I don't believe I've seen a lot of, if at all. Sandy's love of technology going up against Krabs' love of money and being lazy, it just sounds like a great idea. However, just as soon as Sandy's robot goes up against Mr. Krabs, the robot is fired. And Mr. Krabs reminds us how he's so good at kickball with no feet. Robot abuse. Robot abuse. Huh? What the heck is this thing? I don't know, but I'm taking it home. It's so cute. What? Come on, little robot. Let's get you some supper. Not even funny, Karen. Quiet, Plankton. Shh, don't listen to Karen. Shit. I love you, Mom. Now I get it, you want to settle everyone in for a good time, however we are 11 minutes in and I have no idea what's going on. For reference, in the first movie, 11 minutes in, Spongebob is not picked for being the manager of getting into the second Krusty Krab. There's already some sort of conflict or problem to grasp onto. It's actually 15 minutes in when we get to what everything is leading up to, and I get it. Waiting an extra 4 minutes sounds like some entitled stuff and that it isn't a big deal that the conflict takes a quarter of an hour to get into. And you'd be right if what was built up to was worth the wait. The only other thing that happens here is that we get Plankton finally understanding the source of how all of his problems never came from Mr. Krabs, but from Spongebob, whose indirect form of chaos has always been the source or backup of why Plankton could never steal the formula. There's some good action here nonetheless. Our main source of conflict comes from this fellow king. No, this isn't a reskin of King Neptune, but King Poseidon, who tells a great deal about his character and what he's about next to the Chancellor. I need your signature on these taxes, decrees, this here declaration of war, and my paycheck. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Chancellor, when will you learn to focus on what really matters? A monarch's regime is only as powerful as his skincare regime. Word. 
Mm -hmm. Within here, we'd see King Poseidon as almost in love with himself and an addict to the reflection of himself to the point where later on within this scene, we'd see that he would use sea snails to keep from having wrinkles, that being more important than paying his subjects or signing things into being official. While a different vibe than King Neptune who also cared about appearance, I find this more youthful approach to royalty not a bad idea in concept for Spongebob. However, I will say that this place does feel alien so far, like a crossover. It has the feel that something isn't right and I guess that's mainly due to the art style plus a completely different voice cast, character design, and backgrounds. And in some ways that's good because it shows a world outside of the Bikini Bottom, but in other ways that's just the cherry on top as to what's to come. The king would send out a notice that anyone who gives him a sea snail would be handsomely rewarded, to which Plankton would snatch the opportunity faster than tossing a free month of Nitro in a public Discord server. And I love being the bearer of bad news, so let's talk about one of the two major problems with this movie. Gare Bear? Hey, where are you, buddy? Gary? <gasps> this isn't about Gary. This isn't about Spongebob either. Gary. I loved you since the first day we met. This is about Camp Coral. This video, like most YouTube videos, serves as a vehicle to drive advertisements to other things within the video watching experience. And that would be fine and all, however, this isn't a quick reference. They actually stay within Camp Coral for a considerable chunk of the movie. So even if you miss this flashback, there will be multiple. I don't like this, because within our Spongebob universe, we're being brute forced about another spinoff. Now, in an alternate universe, I can see this working because the idea of connecting two shows in universe through a movie works in concept. However, the issue here is that this series has been so full of controversies and being pushed back and retconning so much history and continuity that at this point, I don't see this as a creative decision, but a business decision. And yes, Nickelodeon is in the business of animation, entertainment. However, just because you can creatively put a brand, company, or show within a movie by introducing it as part of the narrative doesn't negate the implied marketing visibility that comes from this. In essence, you're supposed to remember Camp Coral once leaving this movie, thus being a very blatant move to drive people over to the spinoff at the expense of telling an organic movie. I'd find it hard to believe that given other stories that were passed around sound a lot more creative and don't seem to lead into the Camp Coral thing on the surface, that this was picked as being the best story. This like at this point, it's basically product placement. Around a fourth of this movie is dedicated to Camp Coral, a show that apparently has more to do with the movie than the original show and the original cast. That is a bigger audience and most people would come from the original show to watch this movie. And don't get me wrong, I get it, this scene, super cute. However, just like with Night Begins to Shine, I'm not gonna put my opinion on the entire thing aside because they can make one aspect of it look good. We're all animals here, yes, but that doesn't mean I have to suspend my thoughts because of a shiny object. I can both think this is super adorable, but also very convenient for the movie. You wanna show memories of Gary and Spongebob to solidify their bond, thus giving weight to their journey? Why not just say that they meet at Camp Coral? Why do you absolutely have to do it? They'll do this with many of the characters, and unlike Dramarama, where there doesn't appear to be a straightforward connection, this is all the evidence you would need to believe that the movie is flat out making a revisionist history, purely to boost interest in watching the other show, rather than it just making sense. I just hope it makes that other sense, you know, dollars, or else this movie is going to become the most awkward animation Nickelodeon has put out. <laughs> Maybe he left a clue! <laughs> Look! A clue! 
You know, that would be less of a slap in the face if we didn't see this man digging through the cotton of the couch to find his snail. Also, I understand what you're gonna tell me. You're gonna tell me that Plankton thinks that SpongeBob is dumb and he would have never found the exact clue that he needed to find Gary. That would be fine if the movie didn't spend the first 15 minutes drilling into this idiot's head that it's SpongeBob who always stopped him. Yes, Plankton is dumb, but he's not this dumb. Plot convenience is convenient. The lost city of Atlantic City is a scary, vice-ridden cesspool of moral depravity. Wow, all that and it's lost too? Our advice for those traveling here is... Don't! Oh, and another part of this movie, it, I'm left scratching my head. So the way that this movie is organized is that you show us a very flamboyant king who prides himself on presentation. And within this city, that's supposed to be flashy, full to the brim with lights and entertainment and all of these things, it's so dumb. You both A, call it loss, and then B, say not to come. And to me, everything within this city reminds me of something like Las Vegas. And if you were going for that type of city, that wouldn't be a lost city, it would be a tourist trap. That's like calling New York City a ghost town that doesn't make any sense. Yes, this isn't Las Vegas specifically, but given that there are shows and later on we'd see tons of people roaming the streets, the book definitely doesn't portray it in a way that makes sense. It's not lost. However, Road Trip Bound to this lost city sponsored by Plankton and his plans of getting SpongeBob to this lost city to never let him get in the way of a future plan to get a formula, they take a plunge into Act B and this is where the movie falls off a cliff. Think about all of the observable universe. You have interstellar clouds, supernovas, the Andromeda galaxy, tons of stars, comets, probably some lost Yay! space probes, and a myriad of elements. I bet absolutely none of you, not one single person watching this movie was thinking, hey, this movie would do good with lazy meta humor. This is gonna be like one of those buddy movies. We're the buddies. <laughs> Not sure that really applies, Patrick. We're two dudes setting out with a common goal. We'll argue about something dumb, fight and break up, only to come back together when we realize neither could do it without the other. It's simple, yet magical. Oh no, they don't stop there. They keep going. Don't let me stop you. Well, I say buddy movie and you say oh, whatever that dumb thing was you just said. Oh, really? dumb thing? I'm dumb? Oh, I love your sense of irony, Patrick. Thank you. I love my sense of irony, too. Maybe if your head was in fact full of sand, you could have irony! Well, better a head full of sand than a head full of rocks, like yours! Oh, that's it! This scene wants to feel clever because it's playing with words and it has meta humor. It's not clever. For all the flack that I get for analyzing and overcomplicating matters, I find it interesting that they decide to inject smart humor into, what was it? A kid's movie? And for someone jumping into that court, it literally doesn't make sense. They only needed SpongeBob and Patrick to fight over something dumb in order to create conflict despite both of them being on the same page literally the scene before. You know what would have been simpler and more believable? Pull a goofy movie. Have the two diverging Paths. One for the lost city for Gary, and you know what? The other goes to Goofy Goober's ice cream party boat or glove world, whatever you want to call it. And SpongeBob's on the mission. He wants to go straight, wanting to rescue Gary. But Patrick, he's hungry. He's bored already. He wants to have some fun. They argue, but ultimately stick on the path, causing Patrick to be butt hurt, which leads into the fight. That's a more natural way than to brute force a play on words with words that SpongeBob would literally never say. <laughs> sense of irony. That's cute, but let's be real here. The scene was super dumb and forced. To pull off the buddy cop joke, that was unfunny and unnecessary. You can have my rewrite for free. However, I'll keep the same energy here. I did say within Fungus Among Us, they made it seem like Spongebob wasn't necessary to keep the Krusty Krab in line and I didn't like that. Here, they made it clear that people will riot if Spongebob isn't here to keep everything working within the Krusty Krab. I just wish they kept everything in Bikini Bottom. Far, far away from Bikini Bottom, we continue on the journey with our friends as the sponge runs away from why we love the show, and those who we got used to seeing are thrown out the window. Where are we? We must be dreaming. <laughs> you amuse me, SpongeBob. Two people can't have the same dream, let alone be in that same dream at the same time. That would be philosophically untenable. Indeed. You proffer a metaphysical conundrum. Wait. We're talking like smart people. This must be a dream!
I have an honest to god question. Why do they do this all the time? I notice this is a thing with modern Spongebob, where the writing is so blatantly unapologetic, almost to family guy levels, for no reason. This joke doesn't work because you literally were going off of Spongebob and Patrick joking about common tropes in cinema literally a few seconds ago. This would only work if they were acting dumb throughout the movie so far. But you know this, so I'm guessing that the joke is that they did this before, but what I don't get is, why would you be so blatant with it being illogical? Like at least do a joke like this in an hour or so so I can get the dumb sense of irony joke and buddy movie commentary. You're probably even wondering, how are they breathing air in the first place? This looks like a place that looks above the surface world. Good. Hello. Who are you? I am a simple tumbleweed. Call me Sage. Sage. Hey, Sage. Now look, I enjoyed Counter Reeves in the your breathtaking viral moment that went around. Everyone has. In fact, I enjoyed Cyberpunk 2077 so far, even though it is a bit glitchy. I'm playing on the PC version. I actually didn't get it pre-ordered, so I came in with the expectation that it was going to be glitchy a little bit. And more importantly, I enjoyed the story and how they incorporated Reeves, aka Johnny Silverhand, into the big picture. So naturally, what I'm saying is I enjoyed enjoy Keanu Reeves as a personality. That being said, like, how do I explain this? Alright, so with the Gumball movie, whether it's out or not, I love Gumball. You know who else I enjoy? The Undertaker. I don't need to see a live action Undertaker in the Gumball movie. In fact, I don't think it would make sense, even if you would switch up his name. It would look cheesy at best, but humiliating for both sides at worst. I don't think Sage as a character works within the movie. If the first problem I had was the brute forcing of Camp Coral throughout the movie, the other major problem I have is everything involving the live action and celebrity cameos. I didn't like it in Birthday Blowout, and I most certainly hate it here. And I know what you're gonna say, what about David Hasselhoff? How could you like Hasselhoff in the first movie but you don't like Keanu Reeves here? Surely it's the movie doing more of what it did before, you're just biased against the new Spongebob. Well, it's not a one-to-one. -one. David Hasselhoff comes towards the climax of the movie, after seeing majority of the movie in 2D animation, giving us an adventure, music, strong characters, plenty of interactions that we can quote to this day. Sage, among Amongst all the other characters just feel so out of place. They feel like an actual pit stop in what is supposed to be a linear movie. And that's one real life cameo that they focus on. That's not the Cyclops. Yes, this is the same movie I double checked. Yes, that is Snoop Dogg. Look, I'm 23, I'm not exactly the most cool person amongst the youth, but I can name 30 people who are way cooler towards young people than Snoop Dogg. <clears throat> PewDiePie, Ninja, XQC, JoJo Siwa, Jake Paul, Logan Paul, Markiplier, Billie Eilish, Caleb City, Slot, Guava Juice, Dream, The Weeknd, Ariana Grande, BTS, Laserbeam, David Dobrik, although that's probably not <laughs> good anymore, Mr. Beast, Kylie Jenner, literally everyone that's on YouTube trending. And honestly, I kind of feel like an idiot saying these names because if I know who these people are, that means they've been really popular for a while because even a hermit like me knows that eight-year-olds aren't looking at what Snoop Dogg is doing. Literally by the time this video comes out, all of you would have forgotten about the moment that he rage quitted on Madden and left his stream up. And some of you didn't even know he did that. Darn. Basically, the challenge is to free the souls of those who are imprisoned at the Inferno Saloon. Why do we care about this challenge? What part of this challenge was built up to in any way that'd make you care about the people involved? Why did Nickelodeon think they needed to add any of this? Like, I get it. Musical number, paint by numbers within children's movies, and sometimes they can be really good. Here, I'd much rather listen to two styrofoams go at it in an MMA match while getting a bowling ball thrown to the face. And I'm only half kidding. Hey, yo, SpongeBob, I got a dip. Y'all yeah, got this. Bring the prisoners to my office! Huh. What'd that guy mean by prisoners? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my, they're imprisoned. Wow, I feel so pressured to root for them. Oh my god, and they're pretty much done. The challenge is done. Thank you for padding out 10 minutes of my time 
because you don't know how to make a journey to the lost city exciting. Like, I get it, this is a business decision at least, but if you're gonna make a business decision, could you at least make it entertaining? You're in the entertainment business. You're in the entertainment industry, and nothing of value is note within this entire section. Absolutely nothing. In a SpongeBob movie, I'm losing my mind. So as the late great Biggie said, it was all a dream, and we end up with SpongeBob and Patrick back underwater, as they should be throughout this road trip and throughout this movie. However, you know who stays around? Sage. He's kind of like what Mindy was within the first movie, not a one-to-one. -one. However, Sage is a confusing character. He acts as the moral guide to keep SpongeBob motivated on this journey to rescue his pet, but he also serves as the meta way to introduce things such as exactly what's happening with Gary, which means that he does exist within their world, being how they are, and he isn't just there only for SpongeBob and Patrick. And if that's the case, I have just one question. If this powerful, mystical, morally on this side of good, pro Spongebob talking tumbleweed named Sage can conjure up spells to show Spongebob things within a parallel timeline and can create visions so realistic that they feel lifelike, this same tumbleweed can't figure out that Otto was sent by Plankton to intentionally sabotage Mr. Krabs and that Plankton is behind why Gary did all of this. He could do all of these magical and mystical and time-breaking things things. But you can't figure out this thing right here. Hmm, that sounds awfully convenient to make the story work. Hey, at least all of the real life part happens within a dream like that, like a snap. It's not like they wouldn't resort to using the names of real life things within this movie or anything like that. That would be crazy. Ugh, you know I'm kidding. Just roll the clip. Run! Get out of there! Gary! It's not a video chat app like Gary! Skype or FaceTime or anything. Gary! So yeah, Gary's taken in by King Poseidon, will be technically safe until he runs out of snail slime, and until then, they'll throw him into one of these medieval spinny things, I don't really care. But we get back to the Crested Crab, it's barren, it's deserted, we have a defeated crabs. Well, that's restaurants for you, huh? Feast or famine? <laughs> But I digress. Why don't you be a good little loser and hand over the secret formula? Now, let's pause right here. Throughout the history of SpongeBob, there's been a lingering rivalry between Eugene and Sheldon, also known as Plankton and Krabs, respectively. Born out of jealousy, misunderstandings, greed, envy, and stubbornness, this rivalry has built up for decades. With a simple premise, Mr. Krabs has gotten a one-up on Plankton due to SpongeBob and his secret formula. One needs the other to be effective. With just the secret formula, there is no drive. And with Spongebob, there is no destination. I'm not going to argue that Mr. Krabs shouldn't feel defeated. I just praise the movie for accurately portraying the problem with not having Spongebob at the Krusty Krab. In fact, having Mr. Krabs defeated here shows that he has remorse for the thing that he lost through no fault of his own. He understands the impact that the little yellow sponge brings to the establishment and his life, and that gives his absence weight. What I don't understand is this. You're giving up? Oh, Plankton, I wouldn't expect you to understand. I've spent my entire career waiting for this moment, and you roll over like a harpoon whale? I won't let you rob me of my vengeance! Give my regards to your lovely wife. <laughs> yeah. huh. This doesn't, uh, feel quite as good as, uh... Yay, I won. Throughout this entire movie, Plankton has been built up as a struggling villain who's been blinded with envy towards Mr. Krabs that it took Karen pointing out Krabs' stupid kid that caused him to finally reflect and figure out who truly needs to be taken down. This movie makes no sense having this guy be the guy who is not happy with his win. This guy should be jumping over the moon. He's so happy, but here he's reflecting on what he's done and he feels like his victory should have been a little bit different. However, even that's vague, because different how? I doubt he feels guilt for what he's done, or missed the sponge, or even have sympathy for Krabs because Krabs misses the sponge, so it just seems like a cop-out because the story has written itself in a corner and can't just have Plankton win cleanly. Meanwhile, Otto says, quote, congratulations on reaching your destination, and SpongeBob says, quote, the lost city of Atlantis, and no one 
writing the script either knew or cared about how dumb those two sentences sound together. Well, at least here, they salvaged some part of the danger of the city, it being a tourist trap, thus not working with the lost element well. Whatever you do, don't be led astray, don't lose focus, and don't forget why you came here. Don't Thanks, <laughs> Sage Meister. I think we got this. Yes, Sage. I mean, you've been pretty good up until now, but I love Gary more than anything in the whole... Outside, inside, outside. So of course, they get distracted, as if anyone would have predicted otherwise. And we have this fun sequence, which also doubles up as a rather plain way of exploring the city. It shows that the city relies on a shallow level of constant entertainment, as the more Spongebob and Patrick won, the more attention that they receive, which is then translated into them wanting to play more, as they had an audience or entourage as they'd call it, and they'd get chewed out by Sage, who goes on and on about how he explicitly warned them, and also to denies them the ability to see within this window of parallel action or whatever it was called because it's not an on-demand service. Isn't it amazing how these live action characters make the least sense as characters? I know what Mr. Krabs wants. I know what Plankton wants. I know what SpongeBob and Patrick want. I know what Karen wants. I know what the Chancellor and King Poseidon wants. What is Sage's character? What is his goal? How does he work? Where does he come from? What is his motivations? What does he know about these characters? It seems like he's attached himself heavily to SpongeBob and Patrick without knowing that there's a high probability that they would have been distracted by the blinding lights of Atlantis or even how blatantly they're telling you that the window of parallel action or whatever it's called, I'm not going to go back and figure it out, was used at one time for the grossly transparent reason of giving Sage's character a non-story reason to be there, and Spongebob added motivation, and to show the ability to swap between these two environments and have them being connected? Like at least with Mindy, there was motivations. We understood where she came from, her goals, what she knows about Spongebob and Patrick, and as Spongebob and Patrick bump onto the Sage, just like how they fumbled in front of the place, they stumble their way towards King Poseidon. Excuse me, King Poseidon, sire. Uh, there's been a misunderstanding about Gary. Gary? Uh, uh, Gary? Gary? Uh, the snail that you're rubbing all over your face right now? Nonsense. Besides, this snail's name is Fred. Fred? Of course, not only do they not get Gary, but they get locked away. Which, after all of that destruction, I'm surprised they weren't beheaded immediately. Like what the book said. I mean, yes, I know, they are scheduled to be later, but you would think it would happen right then and there. In fact, the more I think about it, that book might be in the top three things I absolutely despise about this movie. It was literally the opposite of what The Lost City of Atlantis was. Meanwhile, to interrupt our Spongebob movie, we get this minor character, you might not know who this character is, their name is Sandy Cheeks, visiting Spongebob's house. Something that Mr. Krabs is too heartbroken to even do once. I mean, Squidward, I get it, even though you could make the argument that he's not gonna get paid without Spongebob. Sandy, rightfully, angrily, tries to figure out what's going on. And I like that she takes on the role of the older sister, aggressively wanting answers from the two people who have a track history of not really caring for the sponge most of the time. Everyone shows that they miss him in their own way. Yes, including Squidward, who is still reading that Kelpie G magazine, which, speaking of Kelpie, is performing at that lost city that you're advised not to go to. You know, the same one that Perch Perkins found and they show on TV that SpongeBob are soon to be executed for going over and doing things over there? Yes, that lost city. The lost city where they tried to steal the king's prize mollusk that everyone knows about, but you're advised not to go there. I am not, I'm going to die on this hill. There's just no way that they looked at this script and they saw that they had written literally the opposite of a lost city and they thought that that was actually Actually, I, I'm in disbelief if they thought that that was actually the way to go about it. Regardless, they plan a rescue, but not before someone else shows up. Excuse me, uh, can I tag along? Plankton? What have you got to do with this? I, 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 I might have had a teensy winchy hand in a very Yeah, high... yeah, yeah, we'll hear about it in the car. Oh man, it seems like they ran out of time to include that crucial part of Plankton's motive, where at the very least, he tries something with the secret formula. If only there was this part where they can cut out, you know, something totally irrelevant and ridiculous, you know, something that involved Danny Trejo and Snoop Dogg. Nah, nah, without that, this wouldn't have been a true Spongebob movie. I'm using sarcasm because I feel like 
like I've ran this annoyed card dry. Literally, this movie has been so blatantly anti-Spongebob that I don't know what hurts more. The fact that it's irreversible at this point, or that the majority of people have become desensitized to it. If it seems like a small thing that I fixate on Plankton and his retrieval of the secret formula, then I don't know what to tell you. Like, this has literally been one of the most consistent things that they have built up for over 20 years of Spongebob. And they've shattered that. They've made Spongebob and Patrick into weird versions of themselves. Sage is around more than Mr. Krabs, Sandy, Squidward, and Plankton, I would bet combined, and the adventures are not even nautical. And to top it all off, we're not even getting into the fact that they've inserted Camp Coral into this on more than one occasion. You've been a true friend this whole time. Never wavered, never faltered. It's just, I failed, that's all. And I'll never see innocent little Gary again. Oh, my heart is broken. <laughs> oh, come on now, fuck up. It's, it's not over yet, Spongebob. What's going on here? I really do want to feel for this scene because I know that Spongebob cares for Gary. But the reason I know Spongebob cares for Gary is because of the show, not the movie. It falls apart here because like with Camp Coral, both the spinoff and the movie need the original show so that they can take shortcuts and motivations. But they so blatantly disregard the show in order to alter or make discontinuous creative decisions that usually end up being subpar anyway. Speaking purely from the movie's perspective, the movie has spent the beginning showing that Spongebob likes Gary, and there's a bunch of scenes about that. But then in the middle, spends the majority of the time showing that time can wait. Gary actually isn't that big of a deal. They get distracted. They get sidetracked. They have a hallucination dream. Spongebob talks less and less about Gary until they're jailed. No memory shared, no Gary's perspective, but it would be illogical to outright say that Spongebob doesn't care about Gary because of the show. And I know that that's false. However, the movie punishes me for knowing about the show, given that it has spent a large part of Act 2 being anything but the show Spongebob Squarepants. Thus, this all is lost moment has so little weight in the way that Spongebob and Patrick being under that heat lamp in the first movie had so much weight. As you'd see that they were trying the entire time, they were getting over their fears. They were taking on challenges. They faced the odds that the movie outright said that they shouldn't have won because they're kids. That's what made it compelling. Here, everything that Spongebob was warned about, he did. Otto did desert them temporarily. He did get distracted after being warned about this exact thing. Sage even admits that they are the worst adventurers ever. And when confronted with the monster holding his pet, he couldn't do anything more than a that's mine and try to take it, only to be obviously locked up. This Spongebob doesn't deserve to have Gary, not because he's a horrible person, but because the story writes him in a way that portrays him as not only the most incompetent sponge I've ever seen in my entire life, but also content with the fact that he has so much time, considering that this is his pet that he's talking about, then he's not taking advantage of it at all. It doesn't help that when he remembers that dumb coin given to him by Sage, Patrick has a point. No matter who gambled it the way, why does the coin matter? You guys use it against Danny Trejo or whatever his name is, I'm not going back to get his name, and it did absolutely nothing there. So if it did nothing there, why would you still hold it in high regard? In fact, why would that be any merit worth arguing about? Why would you take it out on Patrick, who at this point is just a mirror of you, Spongebob? Like, you said he's been nothing but there for you. And this is the kind of writing that gets under old fans' skin. This character is not written to be courageous. This character is not written to be compelling. This character is written to be the winner, regardless of whether it's earned or not. If the story needs it, the story will find a way. And if you don't want that, screw you, because I'm Spongebob, and that's how every story is won. And that's not fun. That's not entertaining. That's why this movie is awful. But it gets better. I can't believe you! You can't believe me? Are you serious right now? Well, maybe you can believe this! I'm out of here! And don't come back! Oh, don't worry, I won't! And by better, I mean this cage joke was actually really funny. I actually really liked it. But besides that, it gets worse. Worse? Dude said way worse. And 
that's how I got SpongeBob out of Bikini Bottom. <laughs> Wait, that's monstrous. Wait, that sounds good. Oh, brother. What do you expect? I'm evil. Yes, you're evil. So why are you on this trip to rescue SpongeBob again? Shouldn't you be using that secret formula to attract customers to your restaurant and try to gain a following given that you have the secret formula? Why not even make some copies of it in case Mr. Krabs asks for it back so you both have the secret formula? Obviously, like I said earlier, this wouldn't work because you also need a SpongeBob, but at the very least, he'd be enacting his evil plans rather than having cold feet right after he wins. So, starting Act C, the final act of the movie, the others find the lost city of Atlantis faster than the original duo. Strange how the SpongeBob character seems to be more competent than the IRL characters that had to be sought after to play a mediocre role within the movie. SpongeBob and Patrick are on the chopping block for crimes against the king, and the rescue crew sneak their way up to the boys how dare you that's about all i can say how dare you come here to the sanctuary of our revered sovereign to rob him of his very lifeblood his adorable good looks <laughs> Go on. I'll give this movie this. When it comes to the new characters in the movie, if you were to split them down the middle between the real life characters and animated ones, I actually really don't mind the new animated ones. I love the Chancellor character, and I find his ability to entertain the audience a great trait about him, given that this supposed lost city is built on this kind of shallowness. The King is also great, and I would even go as far as to say that he's better than King Neptune, honestly, when he put them both up to compare. And I'd also say Sandy and the rescue team did a good job too as far as characters that we know that are animated. So I know this video was long, but do you remember the two problems I had earlier? The first one being the whole Act B being this live action mess with all of this anti Spongebob writing. Well, here's the second problem I have. A lot of Act 3 is pushing Camp Coral hard. <laughs> And provided the editor cuts this correctly, here we see an inflated sponge, a symbol of what's to come with the little guy as far as his franchise goes. As a person who's seen quite a bit of it, the first spinoff so far is underwhelming, but it's not the worst thing I've ever seen, even for Nickelodeon, even for Nickelodeon animation. However, it's amazing how the movie's depiction and the series depiction would be this far off. Like I get it, movies have a higher budget, but look at this, and look at this. The jump is pretty far. Anywho, you'd want to know my main issue with this. So, normally, if a show is able to connect two versions together, then it would be fine. Teen Titans go to the movie, kind of did it. I'm sure there are others. It's not the worst thing in the world and actually it has like this untapped potential if done right. However, the problem here is actually very deceptive. When viewed in a vacuum, I can understand not understanding why the heavy inclusion of Camp Coral towards the end isn't a big deal. So let me show you what I see from my perspective. We started off the movie with SpongeBob in a SpongeBob environment with SpongeBob characters, with one tiny inclusion of Camp Coral, albeit probably the most adorable right at the beginning. All of that is ripped out from under you for a live action musical number and a mini conflict that includes Snoop Dogg and Danny Trejo with Keanu Reeves acting as the guide in this Spongebob movie. We rarely see characters that we know. In fact, always being introduced to new ones, both animated and live action, for a long, long period of time. Spongebob would rarely comment on Gary, with the most significant time being said Camp Coral reference. So that's most of what you can go to when it comes to Gary up until when he sees him. So after seeing Spongebob not really care for Gary, all of these new just for the movie characters, live action this, pop music that, the most bland and safe bare minimum nautical adventure go down, the movie decides to get towards the final moments, the highest point, the climax, the main showdown, by bombarding you with Camp Coral. Even if it is logical, because of how they explain it in Camp Coral, even if that's a choice that they would naturally make, 
My own personal speculation is that more aspects of this movie were of a business decision rather than a creative one. Yes, Nickelodeon, aka Paramount Pictures or Viacom, whoever, all of them were in the business of entertainment. But how come Sony Pictures Animations was also in the business and you don't see people complaining about the music or story choices or casts of Spider-Verse? Or how even in a Teen Titans Go movie, while yes, a business decision to make, you can only find like one time when people were talking about a business decision rather than something being a credit decision, which was the credits at the end. You never see this with Pixar, Lakia, Blue Sky, rest in peace. It's just here where I see a lot of people noticing that this is pretty blatant in its inclusion. And granted, a lot of these movie studios, they're not necessarily making shows that would go on to be a TV show. But it's just so on the nose with how they needed these live action stars or how they think they needed these live action stars just to get people interested in their lowly cartoon or how they needed to push Camp Coral here because if you are a fan of Spongebob, even casually, you're probably going to figure out about Camp Coral from the movie if you aren't an active user of social media. It's perfectly okay to like the movie. In fact, if you like this movie despite everything I said, I truly commend you because to just put all of this aside and enjoy it, I'd like to do that if I don't see the looming cloud of what is to come from all of these spin-offs. And given that the first one is not great, in fact some would say mediocre, that's perfect for Nickelodeon for it to be mediocre because it's not bad enough for people to riot, it's not bad enough for the hardcore fans to say that it's something that needs to be changed, and it's not good enough to satisfy everyone and this is just the future we're talking about here. This movie does not make me want to see the fourth movie because you know there's going to be a fourth movie. This is so diluted with data-driven decisions that it's honestly disgusting. And yeah, yeah, Sandy met Spongebob here. Yeah, yeah, Spongebob has a different voice. Yeah, yeah, Sandy establishes herself as the alpha of the pack. <laughs> It doesn't really matter. <laughs> to those who have seen my Teen Titans Roar review, I noted how the entire thing seemed bitter until the end when it wanted to have fun and the part where they had fun completely shattered all of what it was trying to do initially. And I found it annoying because had they just had fun in the first place, they wouldn't have to push a narrative that no one cares about anymore. Here I have some of the same thoughts. Let me be clear, the origin story of Sandy, Patrick, Squidward, and kind of Mr. Krabs are all very well worded. They're written beautifully and under the context of trying to appeal for Spongebob, serve for probably the best writing and character direction within this entire movie. Let me repeat that. The Camp Coral origin stories serve for the best writing and character direction within this entire movie. Can you not see why that would be problematic? They had ideas, they had the budget, they had the time to find these live action people. They had the data which caused them to make these decisions. And part of me won't shake the feeling that they front loaded a bunch of Camp Coral within the third act so that you would go into Camp Coral feeling positive about their adventures. And now having concrete evidence on what Camp Coral is about, I can say that one did not translate into the other. The fact that the best thing has to do with something else, which is also a way for you to think that that other thing is what it is, is truly concerning. Nevertheless, they do come up with a grand plan to save Gary through a song that's pretty good on its own and it's also a great way to incorporate that entertainment atmosphere into what they're all about. My style! What? Huh? Halt! It's a trick! Seize them! Here we get back to the action after a well executed emotional scene into a musical number. I love how you get to see tiny pockets of each character's personality. Squidward bows right after the musical number is done. Patrick stuffs himself full of food even in the face of danger. Spongebob promises to never let Gary go. I'm quite happy to see these Spongebob characters within this Spongebob movie. We get to this amazing scene here where they hide in a giant knight armor and I love this room by the way and the way that it's lit. For some reason the darker scenes look better here as well, like in Camp Coral. However, at least with the flashbacks to the camp here, they've managed to shade it a lot better. Nonetheless, it's a fantastic scene where they act like a zombified Voltron and somehow they manage to keep the enemies at bay. The way it's all animated looks very energetic and bouncy and was very needed for this action scene. Even having Squidward at the butt of the joke here wasn't that bad given that he'd fall to his death. Lots of Squidward death at this month, but on their way out, they're 
met with King Poseidon. He's actually not upset at all and sees why this would be all good entertainment. Entertainment he hasn't had in a while. This is why he's such a good character because his entire moral compass is so messed up at what entertains him being good enough to satisfy even if it is to others detriment. That's what makes him a good antagonist but also a good Spongebob antagonist given that most of them aren't supposed to be evil in the way that it makes the entire series darker as a whole because just look at Plankton for example. He's evil but he's not show breakingly evil. Even having him forgive all of them makes us look even better considering that he'd have a deal with Spongebob that he'd have to think about. And all charges are dropped Hooray! on one condition. Spongebob will return my snail to me without any more shilly shally. Oh wait what? Just hand over the snail and you can all go free. I... Here we see Spongebob reflect on his journey here. He'd have to battle the undead, take a long road trip that involved hallucinations or co-op dreams, two-player dreams, that actually sounds pretty fun, but that's not what this movie did. He stared death in the face. He was nearly beheaded on a journey that he was warned not to go on, all for this snail. To have it all go to waste wouldn't just make Spongebob look bad on a hero level, but also on a pet owner level, as he promised Gary twice that he would not let him go. And it's here where we see Spongebob finally stand up for himself after his friends have said such nice things and rescued him for this moment. He stands up for what is right of course, he can't give up Gary, although it would make for a very interesting and funny car ride back home if he did though. Through his words he explains that King Poseidon doesn't need snails to keep up his looks. And he'd have to understand that he can't throw all of this away because of what his friends did for him. It would make Spongebob like the worst person ever, in fact it would make him not Spongebob if he threw it all away, given what amazing friends he has and what they did. To which everyone sells out the king, not even vouching to be the king's friend. What about my adoring fans? Nope. My elite palace guards? Mm -mm. Uh, what about my personal trainer? Mm -mm. <laughs> my therapist? Not my tattoo artist? Uh, nope. My tattoo removal artist? No dice. Oh! <laughs> 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 Which to me, while underwhelming as far as everything that happens here, I mean, it's a family movie, so I guess it's fine. He never had friends, that's what made him evil. With the underlying environment that is filled to the brim with the atmosphere of shallowness and constant entertainment for instant gratification and making decisions without thinking for others' betterment. However, through this, SpongeBob does get into Poseidon's head and thus on his side, having him free all of the other snails, as well as himself, which while liberating, his only friend is is going back to the Bikini Bottom. In a twist, however, the ending is interesting. It's snail heavy, which makes sense for the crew, and I found it fascinating that the entire town goes on a frenzy over these snails. However, everyone lives in harmony, both Bikini Bottomite and snail kind. Now before we round this out, a tiny tradition for my movie reviews, I'll put a little remix on it for reviews going forward that involve movies. I'll give you three characters I liked, three characters I didn't like, the character I felt was most consistent, and the character that I feel had the biggest wasted potential. So going in reverse order, I feel like Plankton was so misused in this movie. You have a character traditionally evil, and you decide to throw it away for no reason. And I don't buy the reason that he wouldn't be happy with the formula. In fact, he never ends up giving it back within the movie's runtime unless there's some post-hidden credits and I don't really care at that point, I feel like the formula was tossed aside for Spongebob even though they're both needed. This is Plankton's character, like you actually broke his character in this movie. The most consistent character was oddly the Chancellor. He's always been just business and it showed with his first appearance, wanting to be rightfully paid for the services that he'd offer and I doubt he'd care to defend the king if he wasn't. And I'm actually interested in why they never showed that issue resolved on camera but I'm assuming as far as the business goes that he shoots it straight. And it also shows him as a byproduct of the environment that the lost city of Atlantis is. As far as the worst or most disappointing characters, I'd put Mr. Krabs at three. Out of the mainest crew, he was just the least engaging character and he just kind of seemed to roll over and be there in the beginning and then kind of just defaulted into a generic Krabs appearance towards the end. He wasn't really used to say anything that any other characters didn't get across better within the same scene. Number two, I'd put Otto. Otto still feels like a character that's only there for 
for story purposes. As robotic as his appearance, their lifelessness within the story equally doubles up as both cold towards the viewer, but also uninteresting within the grand nature of the story. And number one, it's a tie. Every live action character, especially Sage. Sage was just a terrible guide and lead. I feel like you could have replaced a lot of what he did with Spongebob's inner thoughts and you would get the same idea across. Plus, how insulting is it for them to never explain the dream scene as nothing more than just that? Even the characters are asking for an explanation and we don't get it. Like, that's insulting. Anywho, best characters, I'd put Sandy at three. She really kicked butt and it showed. She took initiative when the other characters were at their lowest. And Squidward was kind of engaging just because of the way that the story was built and written to minimize the characters we know of. Sandy just stands out the best within the camp of characters that we know of that are animated, that she had more time to shine, unfortunately. Second would be Spongebob or Spongebob and Patrick if you want to really stretch out what I'm about to say. As meh as the journey was, I believe he served as a great role in the journey, obviously, and within the Camp Coral flashbacks, which I do count as being the same character despite different voices. I feel like while needing improvement, he was solid enough to understand what's going on for this family movie. And you know, if you ignore a lot of the criticisms I have here, he's not the worst. He could have been a lot worse here. However, the best character by by far is King Poseidon. Consistent, amazing, engaging, quotable, great character design, great voice. He was the star in the way that this movie was oddly built more around him than around the sponge. Overall, the movie is awful. And while it was fun to go through, probably not as fun to write. And I'll let the editors uh, explain if they <laughs> feel like it was uh, pretty brutal to edit. <laughs> but um, it doesn't give me that great hope about the series going forward. And considering that I'm actually recording this around the time when I'm pretty sure I already put out a video about what's going on with the series at this point, the main one. Yeah, this isn't that great. I consider SpongeBob to be one of my all time favorites, probably my favorite Nicktoon, probably a tie between Fairly Odd Parents and SpongeBob. And as someone who grew up with it and has fully understood that it's going in a direction that I would never fully see it as fun or entertaining, this movie just feels like either the beginning of the era or like the acknowledgement of this new Spongebob that I didn't grow up with. And that's perfectly okay because this is a new generation and a new audience that will love this Spongebob. It's just a shame that we never really truly knew how good we had Spongebob until it was gone. And leaves and some other Sponge comes back and there's a spin-off and a movie with Snoop Dogg, Keanu Reeves, and Danny Trejo. Thank you so much for your time. Take care. Ugh, this movie sucked.